Notable Charleston attorney Robert Rosen is concerned about the future of Charleston. In this special edition of Quintus Close Ups, I speak exclusively with him one on one. And be sure to download the free Quintus Close Ups app in your Apple or Google Play stores. Robert Rosen. Yes, sir. How are you? I'm doing just great, man. What's going on? Ah, a whole lot more. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've got some fancy equipment here. I know. <laughs> We gotta talk about the bells, I guess. Right. <laughs> Sorry about that. No. <laughs> but you know, you and I ran into each other at Brighton Church Streets on Tuesday afternoon. Yeah. And the talk about conversation was about the change in Charleston. Right. You've been here as long as I have. Well, I'm twice as old as you are. That's true. seventy. Oh wow. <laughs> <laughs> but how has this particular city that you really love changed in your mind? Um. I think the change has really been very, very dramatic. You know, it was sort of gradual. In other words, Charleston after World War II was pretty run down and pretty poor, very poor. Um, people don't remember, but like when I was growing up, um, South of Broad, most of the houses were run down. And, and, and even when I was growing up in the, in the 50s and the 60s, um, Charleston was a pretty shabby place. I mean, there were a lot of nice houses, that's true, but people couldn't afford to keep them up. And, uh, King Street went into a real decline. You know, when the mall when the malls opened, right. in the suburbs, right. uh, downtown, you know, you had empty buildings and you had um, dilapidated buildings. So when Joe Riley became mayor, and we're talking now a long time ago, now 1975, 40-something years, um, he wanted to redo the downtown. Um, and so things started booming in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Um, and that change was very gradual. So the city looked a lot better, and things improved, but you didn't get the feeling that the city was being overwhelmed, you know, with development. But somehow in the last five to ten years, I think everybody in Charleston in the last five years, three years, two years, um, has woken up to the fact that a lot of things that were in the planning stages in the 90s and early 2000s have now happened. Mm -hmm. People were planning these hotels. People were, we're planning these apartment complexes, but they hadn't happened yet. Well, now they have happened. Um, and so I think what we've got, you know, is really a very different city um, from the city that was, you know, around 10 years ago. We've got um, a lot of big buildings, we've got a lot of hotels. I mean, they're not big by national standards, they're not big by New York or Chicago right, standards, right. they're big by Charleston standards. And so um, there's a whole different feeling in the city. The traffic is four times, ten times where it was. Um, the, the number of buildings, the number of tourists, and, you know, I'll be, I'm standing to be corrected, but we now have something like five to six to seven million tourists a year. Right. Well, I mean, 20 years ago, nobody could have dreamed that that could have ever happened. Um, and so uh, I think a lot of Charleston people, a lot of natives, people who moved here, I think I'm concerned about the pace of development, mm -hmm. um, and just the whole city is just in a, a, a over rapid state of, of development. What should that pace of development be like in your mind? Well, slower. <laughs> um, you know, I think that people who live in a place um, have to adjust to change. Um, and everybody does have to adjust. I mean, we can't stop people from building buildings. Right. You can't stop people from using the land. Um, and, and, and I think there's differences of opinion. I mean, I think some people like the development. I mean, I think a lot of the younger people like the idea that I'm living in a big building on Meeting Street with 400 units and I can ride my bike the wrong way down the street and uh, you know, harass older people driving their cars. Um, and so, you know, I think it depends on who you're talking to. You know, if you're talking to older people who are used to getting in their car, driving to King Street, parking their car somewhere. Right. I mean, those days are over. And um, so I think the younger people, and you know, Charleston really, somebody wrote something on a website that I read about a year ago saying people think of Charleston as being kind of a dowdy, old, historic city. But the truth is it's a very young, a lot of young people <clears throat> you know, it's a lot of youthful energy. I mean, a lot of new people have moved here, a lot of new buildings, a lot of new apartments. So I think 
for some of the residents um, who've been around for a while, I mean, even people who moved here 10 years ago, right? Uh, they were expecting a certain quality of life. Um, and that quality of life has been, you know, seriously eroded. I mean, if you moved to Mount Pleasant 15 years ago, you were living in a quiet, kind of, not sleepy, but I mean, a moderately uh, developed subdivision of Charleston. That's not turned into a big city. I mean, you got major highways, real traffic problems. Um, in downtown Charleston, I think with all the hotels and um, the new apartment complexes have become uh, very difficult, you know, to drive and, and park and live the way we were living. And I know in that conversation yesterday, there's always a conversation about development, but there's always right behind development in that conversation right. is about gentrification. Right. right. Where are you with this discussion? Well, I mean, gentrification is, um, what it means, I think, is that um, some neighborhoods, generally poor neighborhoods, um, have become popular um, with more affluent people. So the developers and the affluent people buy everybody out and they're gone. Um, now, of course, gentrification has been going on since the beginning of time. I mean, in other words, you know, certain neighborhoods um, that were run down or not desirable, for whatever reason, have become desirable. <clears throat> and so the people with money will buy out people who don't have any money who are going to sell out. And gentrification, um, a lot of times people associate with racial issues. So you have like the black community living in, a, in the central city. I mean, this, just a stereotype of the whole thing. And then all of a sudden, this becomes popular with the young affluent people. And these people get bought out or, or pushed out by landlords. And their whole neighborhoods are destroyed. But, but there's gentrification going on at every level. I mean, when we were talking yesterday, the South Abroad used to be a mixture of many different socioeconomic groups. You would have poor folks living in South Abroad in pretty run down houses or in apartments or living behind a big house. Um, and I mean, in the 50s, <clears throat> in the 40s and 50s and into the 60s, there was substantial black people living in South Abroad. A lot of people don't know that. Um, after the Civil War was over, Everybody was living in this, you know, different neighborhoods. Segregation, you know, came on later. And so, so South Abroad, uh, in my childhood, was a, a mix of different socioeconomic groups. Today, uh, downtown Charleston has become, I mean, it's, can, only affluent people can live in downtown Charleston, unless you live in government subsidized housing. College students um, rent out apartments, but of course they're not really poor. They've got their parents paying them rent. And, and, and what's really kind of scary is even the rundown houses that the college kids used to live in, they're not there anymore. In other words, um, the, after the college kids are living in apartment buildings on East Bay and on Meeting, right, in very fancy apartment complexes, those old rundown houses have now been bought out by wealthy people. So you don't see that many shabby houses in downtown Charleston anymore because they're all being bought out. And then the gentrification is just going on and on in Hampton Park, right. where I grew up. Right. Um, you know, it's still um, integrated, it's still racially mixed, but I mean, it's going in the wrong direction because, I mean, essentially, affluent people, mostly white, not entirely, but are buying up all that property. So, I mean, uh, you know, Charleston, um, what's happening is people on the lower socioeconomic end of things are going to find themselves being moved out to Holly Hill and, you know, Way out of West Ashley, just far away from the urban center, and that's I mean that's worrying me because it's changing the character of the city. And also, when we talked yesterday about gentrification, you said it doesn't happen mostly to African American right. people, but Caucasians as well. Right. That's that's what's funny. A lot of the people who grew up, white people who grew up in downtown Charleston, South of Broad, um, their families sold houses. So ten years ago, when they, somebody offered them seven hundred fifty thousand dollars for a house they paid twenty five thousand dollars for, they sold. And um, so when you look at it, it's uh, the, the middle class white families and even wealthy white families are being moved out by these super rich. <laughs> I mean, uh, South Abroad now um, is being bought out by um, people who have moved here um, from Atlanta, New York, Chicago. Uh, a lot of the houses are not even, people don't even live there. I mean, they're second, third, and fourth homes. So, I mean, on, just on my street, 
um, out of on Water Street, I've got at least two houses out of maybe 10, maybe more. Uh, people don't live there. I mean, they're not residents of Charleston. They live in other cities and just come down to visit. So it'd be like if I wanted to have like a house in Florida or something. So I don't think that's good. It's not good because they don't vote. They pay taxes. So it's good for the economy because if you've got wealthy people from New York who are paying huge taxes, which they are, they're not going to the schools, they're not using the police, they're not using any municipal services, but they're paying high taxes. So in that sense, it, it's, it's good in the financial sense, but it's bad in the community sense because they're not, they don't live here. They're not voting. They're not part of the community. They're just coming down to party and vacation. Uh, now, some of these people live here part-time and they're involved in civic affairs. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think the city has also benefited. I'm not saying everyone has moved here. Uh, there are a lot of people who have moved here, who live here part of the year, who are part of the Charleston community, who are on boards like Smart Charleston or uh, the Symphony and things like that. Right. Um, and a lot of the newer people who moved here, Kiowa and Daniel Allen, have been very, very uh, generous. I mean, the truth is, the Symphony, the Gibbs Art Gallery, uh, all these things have benefited by a lot of this new money. Um, but at the same time, we've become very, very crowded. And, um, and we have places where people are just only home and not living. Well, Dan, how could you articulate that to the local governments? Well, this is going to sound terrible. Um, I, I think that, um, it's, first of all, the government cannot stop private people from buying land and houses. So what can you do? You can't make a law saying, if you didn't go to public school in Charleston, you can't live in Charleston. <laughs> I mean, I have a right to move to New York and get an apartment if I want to. Um, so I don't know as much the government can do about that. Um, I think the Airbnb controversy, which I was really involved with, sure. um, that's a perfect example of um, money and developers running amok. Um, people renting out their houses illegally. It's illegal to rent your house out as a hotel. I mean, and I don't know why people can't understand this, but there's all these crazy letters to the editor. But I, 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 have, I can use my property any way I want. Well, that's not true. Zoning laws were enacted to protect the health and well-being of the community. So you zone the areas industrial, so that the industrial, uh, the danger of industrial areas would be in one part of town, and then you zone the areas residential, so people could live a quiet existence and not have businesses ruin their peace of life. And then you had commercial areas zoned so that stores could be there. There was a reason for zoning. So if you own a house in the subdivision, you have absolutely no right to rent out your house to somebody else, um, you know, for a week for a party. I mean, that's a commercial use. It's illegal. It's actually criminal. And um, I told the mayor and city council that they needed to appoint me to be city attorney or assistant city attorney for two weeks, not arrest 10 people and uh, prosecute them. And that'd be the end of the Airbnb problem. Because really, uh, Airbnb, what they're doing is they're taking neighborhoods, not just in the historic district. A lot of people think it's just a downtown thing. But you take some subdivision like um, Burns Town or uh, Avondale, uh, that's right across the bridge. So people, you could live in a neighborhood where you might have the only house that anybody actually lives in. Every other house in your street could be rented out week to week to tourists. Um, and that's happened around the country. I, I did a lot of work on this. I read an article, there was a guy in an apartment building somewhere. And one day he woke up and realized he was the only person living in the building. It was, he, was a, he, he lived in a building. He was, he was a tenant. One day he woke up and realized of the 30 apartments in the building, 29 of them were Airbnbs. <laughs> so, and I mean, uh, so for example, I think Airbnb is really, um, I think it has its place. You know, I think it was properly regulated if you were living in the house and you rent out a room over the garage. Um, but I think that's a problem. And, I, and, and, and the other thing is, I don't think the city government um, has, I think the city government has bought into the whole develop at any cost mentality. In other words, if you're a developer and you want to build a hotel, you're, you know, you're in a deal to make money. You know, you're not there to do anything good for the community.
community. You're there to build something and make money for your investors. So every hotel in Charleston that has come online in the last few years, every one of those developers has tried to get more square footage, less parking, higher than the height or less. And it, it's, a, it's like, I watched this thing and you know, the waterfront park, there's a hotel there. Well, that was supposed to be five stories, maybe six stories, I forget. But they bargained with the city if they gave a little strip of land in the waterfront park, they could have another story. And then you go to King Street, and this guy's got another reason why his should have another story. And you had the Dewberry Hotel, where he wasn't supposed to have the rooftop bar, but you know. So, so they just pushed the envelope. And I think the city government needs to step up to the plate, hire some more lawyers, arrest some people, bring some lawsuits. I mean, I got the city to bring the only lawsuit against Airbnb, an Airbnb owner, that has ever been brought. I did the work, I wrote the pleadings, I got the affidavits. So I, I just don't think the legal department is doing what they should be doing. Now, are you fearful of people actually coming to sue the city over this whole situation? Well, I think the city is fearful. Um, I think the Sergeant Jasper right. fiasco, that, that's one of the worst things that's happened. Uh, in the last five years because that's a very complicated story and I'm not taking sides one way or the other one. But what I am saying is that they, they got threatened with a lawsuit and the judge ruled against the city on something. And I think it's made the city gun shy. And the city shouldn't be gun shy. The city should be standing up for the laws. I mean, Sergeant Jasper, you know, they may have lost part of that case, but that doesn't mean they're wrong in every case. So I think the city needs to get a little on the backbone. And if you were to write like a letter to the editor, what would you say about the future of Charleston? Well, I don't think there's enough pages in the newspaper to be enough room for me to print that letter. Well, I'm, I'm concerned about the quality of life for the residents. In other words, I'm, I don't object to hotels. I don't object to business. Actually, I don't object to apartments. I mean, if you're going to build apartments that people are going to live in, not just have air tourists. I mean, I think tourism has got to be a play around the planet. Um, tourism is a good business, and people make money, all the restaurants, I mean, <laughs> I used to be able to walk down Broad Street, right. go to the Brown Dog, right. get a sandwich, I can, you, know, you got to get in line behind the tourists to get lunch. Okay, I get it, the, the restaurants are making money, hotels are making money, people have jobs, those things are good. But when there's so many tourists, and there's so many people that you really ruin the quality of life, then I think you've got to start looking at some serious regulation. You know, I have a friend who's in South America right now, and he wanted to go to Machu Picchu, you know, that Indian thing, you got to climb up the mountain. Well, there were so many tourists climbing up that mountain, they're about ready to destroy the actual historic site. So now, in order to make that climb, you have to sign up for it, you have to get a pass, and it's just too many people. Okay. And so I think that's kind of what's happening with Charleston. I mean, I think you can have a lot of people, but um, when there's total gridlock with traffic, when there's going to be an endless number of hotels, apparently, you know, just this means buses, this means traffic jam, it means the quality of life of people living in the peninsula um, becomes very difficult. Now, the reason these people are coming to Charleston is because they think, or they thought, or it's supposed to be a charming old city with beautiful houses and nice oak lined streets. Right. Well, I mean, if you can't drive down Church Street, you can't walk down Church Street because you've got so many tourists, you've, you know, you, it's, I mean, listen, uh, I'm going to Japan in a couple of weeks and I'm going to go to Kyoto and all these things. Well, you know, the tourists, if, if all you are is just one tourist just jammed in a street and you can't actually see anything, um, you know, what's the point of it? Um, Venice is a perfect example of it. Venice, um, they, they've got so many people, you, you can't move, they've got cruise ships, and it's just, I just think Charleston's got to deal with this, um, I think that, that we need to stop with the hotels, we got enough hotels, um, people can stay on the outskirts and come in, I think we need to have some parking decks where people can get out of their cars, I think we need parking for residents, in other words, parking garages, the people who work in downtown right. need to be able to park in downtown. Um, I, I've traveled abroad. I went to Italy and I went to a town and um, I had a rental car mm -hmm. and uh, I'm riding around looking for a parking space and I saw all these spaces that had blue lines on them. Well, you know what that meant? That meant 
only residents of that town could park there. It was kind of sad, right? So I was a tourist, right? so I had to park in the garage, you know, five blocks away. Huh? I mean, the residents want to live there. And so I think the city's got to do more to protect the residents. Robert Rosen, thank you so much for your time. I really, really appreciate <laughs> this. Enjoy being with you. Likewise. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>